It's the week of November 26, 2018, and you're listening to the Missouri Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Pioneer Field Agronomist Jamie Farmer, and with me this week are my two counterparts to the East, Nick Monning and Shannon Claiborne. Welcome back to the show, Nick, and welcome to the show, Shannon. Glad to be here. Glad to have you both here today. So last time, you know, I had two special guests with our product agronomist, Ryan Schmidt, and our technical product manager, Bill McClure, talking a little bit on how we advance new products at Pioneer, something that's definitely uh, taken a lot of their attention right now as they continue to make those advancement decisions. This week, we thought we'd focus a little more back on agronomy. So I know there's still quite a few acres of soybeans left to get out of the field out there. There's really not much to say about that. Everyone already knows when you get those out of the field. So instead, we wanted to briefly hit on some of the fall herbicide applications one last time. We've seen several sprayers, some of those nurse trucks running around out there in the field. And so we've been getting some questions from folks that were planning on putting fall post-emergent herbicide application on the wheat they did get planted. And also uh, some of those that are wondering about the fall herbicide applications they were planning on making on that ground that was going to either corn or soybeans for 2019. So with the weather that we'd been having, you know, with some of the field being wet and then frozen, it's definitely thrown a wrench in some of the plans out there. So Nick, you know, what is one of the first things that we would need to remember if we're making, you know, say any sort of herbicide application to control weeds that have already emerged out there in the field? Yeah, Jamie, the first thing you have to remember anytime you're applying a herbicide to emerged weeds, they've got to be actively growing. So at this point in the time, all the winter annuals, a lot of them have come up. So we're going to be trying to control emerged weeds. So when we get below freezing, weeds are not going to be actively growing. And when temperatures dip below 25 degrees, for most weeds, that'll cause some leaf damage. Winter annuals, which would be the weeds up now, they will handle temperatures below 25, usually down around 20 degrees, before we start getting any leaf damage. Why that's important is because if we cause some leaf damage, they're probably not actively growing and to take in herbicide. But they will begin growing again once we get some conducive conditions. And what the biggest point there to look for is you want to wait until we get some new leaf tissue out there on those winter annuals before applying that herbicide if you go through a pretty pretty deadly freeze or something that's pretty harsh on leaves. Some, some of the things like we experienced last week really. Most of the time when the temperatures increase to close to 50 during the day and 35 at night for a couple days, winter annuals will begin actively growing again. Then you also need to remember that you're going to need some bright sunshine within these few days in order to get that the weeds actively growing again. Cloudy conditions are going to halt their growth as well. Excellent point, Nick. Mentioning the temperature ranges there and how that affects growth on plants, also going to affect how quickly that kill does occur. So a lot of times folks that make a fall application for the first time kind of tend to wonder whether or not that herbicide's working out there in the field. But when those temperatures are lower, you know, obviously that metabolism and the processes in those plants are a little bit slower. And so it takes a little bit longer to get a kill too. You also want to keep in mind if you're spraying emerged wheat, if the weeds aren't growing well, then the wheat will not be either. So that means it will be harder for the wheat to metabolize that herbicide and you may get some crop injury out of the application. When we have a good growing condition for weeds, we have good growing conditions for the wheat. And so we usually get herbicide, pretty good herbicide metabolism in that wheat as well. So bottom line, Nick, if I'm trying to kill winter annuals that have already emerged, you know, which would be about every field now, what do I need as far as conditions go then? Yeah, so just mentioned some specifics in terms of leaf damage and temperatures, but really what it comes down to, if we're going to apply a fall applied herbicide for burn down control, which is what's going to be going on now, you really need 40 to 60 degrees is kind of the range we can apply from. Obviously, like kind of like you mentioned, Jamie, the warmer it is, the better it works or the faster the metabolism. The cooler it is, the slower they work, and we may reduce weed control if it gets too cold. So right now, if it were me, I'd look for a window where we're going to see the low temperatures are staying above freezing and the highs are in the 50s or close to that for a few days in a row. So I know that's asking for a lot right now, but that would be more ideal. And if you were applying to something like wheat, ideally you'd want those temperatures a little warmer. You probably want something more like 40s for lows and close to 60 during the day. Uh, you're also going to want, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to want a good stretch of sunshine within this few day window applying these herbicides. Also, don't forget that fall is the best time to control mare's tail. I know mare's tail is one of those weeds, which is one of our most problematic for uh, Missouri growers. We've got some pretty good products that work well in wheat. So, 
Culex and Weed offers excellent control of mare's tail. Elevore for a fall burn down is great on mare's tail as well. Um, or you could even use like a broad spectrum fall control such as basis blend on acres going to corn in 2019 or Canopy EX or Canopy works great on acres going to soybeans in 2019. So just plenty of good options out there, but definitely consider if you have some fields that are just nightmares on mare's tail, Mother Nature doesn't necessarily give us the advantage in the spring here in Missouri to get after that fall emerged mare's tail, so the best time to do that's in the fall. One of the other things to kind of keep in mind too uh, is just how pH is also important when you're considering residual herbicides especially. If you think about those no-till ground, uh, you kind of want to limit some of that liming applications that you're making right now to one and a half tons per acre, just to make sure that you can watch out on that no-till ground, creating any high pH that would also have any injury effects from some of those uh, residual herbicides where you've got to watch pH. Um, pH also important, you know, we're just talking about liming. It does definitely has some effects on fertility as well. So Shannon, what would be some of the major benefits for those folks that are considering liming or, or out there making some lime applications of those fields right now? Yeah, good question, Jamie. You know, many growers are still getting their soil samples taken or already received their results back from the fields that they've sampled this fall. And they're deciding on what to do for the upcoming growing season, how to prioritize their fertility inputs. And oftentimes the fertility management tends to focus around the P and K inputs versus the liming sometimes on the low soil pHs. But many may not be aware of the impact of low soil pHs on the efficiency of their fertilizers in the field for crop uptake. Take, for instance, a soil pH of a 5.0. That can decrease the availability of their NK by almost 50%. And on phosphorus, it's almost two-thirds of the availability is reduced. That includes both the nutrient level already in the soil at the time of sampling, as well as additional fall or spring fertilizer applications. That simply isn't acceptable at this time with current crop prices to not be more efficient with your fertilizer dollar than that. Even at a pH of a 5.5, your NK is reduced at availability by almost 25%, and your phosphorus at 50%. That situation alone wastes about a third of your total fertility available for the upcoming growing season. So even if you have optimum fertility levels of P and K, a low soil pH would effectively reduce your fertility levels to, to a low level. Yeah, that's excellent point, Shannon. When you're talking about just how much dollars that you could be wasting by not having an ideal pH out there, I think that's something that we've heard before in the past where liming is some of the best money spent on the farm. But what are some of the other benefits outside of fertility that liming can bring us? For soybeans, ensuring that your soil pH is at the 6.5 to 7 pH level You'll improve the inoculation for your soybeans and the soybean inoculant by creating a better pH environment for your nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And also, just as uh, you mentioned earlier, that low soil pHs will affect your soil-applied herbicides, increasing their effectiveness and their residual levels. And so that goes for the summertime as well as the winter. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, we were just talking earlier about fall applied applications, but definitely correcting those pH problems out there will help you with summer annual weed control as well. So definitely some good points there, Shannon, for folks to remember when we're talking about liming. So with that, that's all we had for you today. Uh, Shannon, it's always important for folks to know where to find us if they can't find us in the field. They can find the podcast at podcast.pioneer.com or they can find us on Twitter at Red Raider KS, at Dickie Scott, at Nick Monning, and at the Jamie Farmer. You can also reach out to your Pioneer sales professional and get signed up for those Walk in Your Fields newsletters and other timely agronomic info delivered to your inbox. And so with that, again, we thank you for your time, we thank you for your business, and we look forward to speaking with you again.